For this video, I'm going to give you a hopefully brief rundown of the information in Chapter 5, which is our eukaryotic, mostly microbial organisms. Um, this is another one of those you're just going to have to memorize a whole bunch of information that goes along with this chapter. Um, your book gives you tables, and then I gave you tables that recreated those to try to help you learn them, because I'm a table person. It's how I uh, learn a bunch of information like this. Um, and then it goes into more detail on those, and so that's how I've also positioned the PowerPoint. I'm really just going to do a really brief rundown of the information that's in the tables, and then if you need to look up terms and other stuff, that's where you would go through the rest of the PowerPoint presentation, essentially. So the first thing that I want to mention is that protists are not a true taxonomy term anymore. Um, they used to be considered a kingdom back during Whitaker's days. They aren't anymore because they are polyphyletic. Um, like I said on this slide, um, they are, that polyphyletic really just means they're not monophyletic. Monophyletic would mean that they were all related to an ancestral organism, and protists aren't. There are some protists that are more closely related to fungi than they are to another protist. There are some that are more closely related to plants than they are to other protists. So this shows you just how different all of the different protist groupings are. However, since we have been talking about protists for hundreds of years at this point, um, we still tend to consider them their own separate group. It's just that they're not all related to each other. Okay, so in the table for the protists, first thing we have is supergroup excavata. There's multiple subgroups for this. Um, the subgroup fornicata is the first one that we are going to talk about, and what's unique about them is that instead of doing a micro and macro nucleus like some of the other groups are going to do, or just having one nuclei, these have two nuclei, but they're equal in size. They don't have mitochondria, so they don't make their own energy. Instead, they are going to tend to steal energy from somebody else. Um, they're usually going to have four flagella floating around someplace outside of the cell. Uh, Giardia lamblia is the example that I'm giving you for that, and it causes giardiasis. That is um, more commonly called beaver fever, and I've got some other slides that explain how giardiasis works out. The parabasilid group also have no mitochondria. They also have four flagella. Um, one that they also, in addition to that, have an attached flagella flipping off the other side from the four free ones that they have. This one doesn't form cysts, and the kinetoplastids that it mentions, those are modified mitochondria, so they still have something that's going to help produce energy for them, but it's not a traditional mitochondria. The example that I'm giving you here is trichomonas vaginalis. This is what causes trichomoniasis, which is a vaginal STD. Um, I say vaginal because it's usually diagnosed in women. Men tend to be more asymptomatic, and so you usually see the problem more often in the vagina than you would in the penile system, shall we say. The euglenozoan subgroup is still within the excavata group. Um, euglenozoans are interesting because some of them are free living and cause you no harm and in fact are beneficial, and some of them will make you wish you were dead, essentially. Um, this group does have flagella as well. Sometimes one organism can be photosynthetic during one portion of its life and then be heterotrophic in another. Sometimes an organism will be one or the other um, and not be both during different points. And so it's kind of a diverse group when you look at it that way. I've given you several different um, model organisms because the table in your book did as well. Euglena is one that can be either or during the course of its life. So it can be photosynthetic if the water quality is good and light is penetrating the water column fairly well. But if the water starts to get too turbid because of erosion or nutrient pollution or whatever, it will actually kick its chloroplasts out and then switch to a heterotrophic state. And so euglena can actually be used to determine whether or not water quality is good. Uh, the two trypanosomes that I'm giving you, they cause two different diseases. They look pretty similar under the microscope, though. So trypanosoma brucei is what causes African sleeping sickness. Um, it's called that because the person gets really tired as their red blood cells are killed off, and then they fall asleep and they never wake up. Uh, Trypanosoma cruzi causes Chagas disease, which is something that we do see here in Texas. That's why I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about Chagas. I have an article that I'm going to give you for that one um, that came from, if I remember right, Science, um, which is a journal. It's transmitted by kissing bugs, whereas Trypanosoma brucei is transmitted by the tsetse fly. Um, Chagas disease destroys the heart, and a person can be asymptomatic while the heart damage is happening and then all of a sudden their heart fails on them. Um, and so it's it's common in the Gulf area of Texas. Um, 
I'm debating how much I want to say relating to this since I'm going to give you the article that kind of goes along with that. But I guess I'll, I'll stop on that one and just say make sure you read the article on Chagas disease because more people need to be aware of it. It's more common than we think it is. Um, leishmania causes leishmaniasis, which is not something that you see in Texas unless a person travels out of state to Central America and then comes back with it. Um, leishmaniasis is what you're seeing here in this picture. It basically eats away at the skin and causes huge problems. And the person has to take chemotherapy to get rid of it. It's a super brutal disease. It's transmitted by sand flies. And so if you go to a beach in a Central American place and you get bitten by some of the bugs on that beach, um, you can get leishmaniasis from that. And so it's something you want to be on the lookout for. Make sure you wear your repellents when you go to those places. Next, supergroup chrome alveolata. Um, the first subgroup in here is going to be our dinoflagellates. This group has two flagella. Um, they have, it's not really a complete cell wall. They have plates that's like a cell wall. Um, it's called a theca, and it is made out of cellulose. Um, Gonulax causes red tides. We'll talk about that more in the other part of the PowerPoint. Um, Alexandrium can cause paralytic shellfish poisoning, which if you eat a shellfish that has been growing during a red tide, um, it can paralyze you and then you stop breathing and die. Um, Fisteria can also cause some harmful blooms. The picture here is of a red tide, which we can get around the Gulf Coast down in Texas, and so it's something you want to be on the lookout for. Next, the AP complexins. I used to always make a joke that the AP complexins were called that because they had a complex life cycle, but as it turns out, their name actually means they have an apical complex, which is this little structure on the tip of the cell um, here where they cluster certain organelles, and so they're called AP complexins because they have an apical complex. That said, they do still have a pretty complex life cycle. Um, plasmodium, there's different species of that, but it causes malaria, which is transmitted by the Anopheles mosquito. Cryptosporidium parvum causes diarrhea. Um, you tend to see that in Texas in the summertime when people start going into rivers and lakes. Um, you can also get it from pools. So make sure if your kid is not potty trained, you don't take them to pools where they might poo in the pool and then give crypto to other people, essentially. Um, Babesia causes babesiasis, and I always say that incorrectly, I'm quite sure, so you can Google how to say that one. Um, it's a pretty brutal disease that can be transmitted by ticks. Toxoplasma gondii causes toxoplasmosis. Um, toxoplasmosis can actually cause mental illness. It's really, it's a weird parasite that can do a weird form of mind control, especially in rats. There's some interesting Google videos out there about that, but what will happen is the parasite will get into the rat and it makes the rat unafraid of cats. So the cat will eat the rat and then the cat will get toxoplasmosis. Well, the cat will shed the toxoplasma in its feces. And so if somebody is changing the litter box, they may inadvertently aerosolize some of that and then inhale some of the toxoplasma. And then they can get toxoplasmosis from that. And then that can lead to symptoms like schizophrenia. Um, it is also known to cause birth defects. And so this is one of the reasons why pregnant women should not be changing the litter box is because it can permanently harm the fetus as well. Um, ciliates are called that because they all have cilia. This is Stentor. It's one of my favorites. This video comes from Journey to the Microcosmos, which if you've never been to that site, they have some just gorgeous videos. And I love this part because these two Stentors are like playing catch with a paramecium. This one kind of throws it over and then this one catches it and then this one throws it over and this one catches it. And I could really watch it all day. So if you're ever stressed out, go to Journey to the Microcosmos and that can help you out. Um, Belentidium causes belentidiasis, which is an intestinal disease, tends to cause diarrhea. Um, paramecium is this poor little guy that is the ball the two stentor are playing with. They tend to be pretty low on the food chain. They eat bacteria. Um, and stentor is the larger organism. So both the paramecium and the stentor are ciliates in this picture. Okay. Um, the oomycetes or piranoma, I always say this one wrong too, piranosporomycetes. This one includes water molds, which are very fungus-like. Uh, Phytophthora is what caused the Irish potato famine. Um, if you ever go to Rhode Island, specifically, oh my god, Portsmouth, no, Portland? Oh my god, why can't I not remember the name of that place that I went to? Um, sorry, Rhode Island, y'all can bash me later on. You're such a small thing, you'd think I'd be able to remember, like, your capital city. Um, but they have this uh, whole area where they have statues and memorials for the Irish pitto famine because they had a fairly large number of Irish people that settled in here. And so this is a statue that's commemorating some of the death that happened as a result of this. And it was all, all caused by this water mold infecting the potatoes and then ruining the crop for that year. Okay. 
different supergroup, Rhizaria. Um, this group is going to have pseudopodia that are going to tend to be, instead of fat and globule like the amoebas are going to get later on, they're going to be more needle-like or pointy, if you will. Um, it ends up looking sort of like hair cells that come off of hairs, uh, roots, pardon me, and plants, and so that's why it's called Rhizaria. Um, the foraminiferans, they're usually just called forams for short. Um, think an amoeba, but in a chalky shell, and that's what a foram is. Uh, foraminiferans are what create the chalk that we tend to have in our area, like limestone. If you were to look at it under a microscope, you would find a lot of these little things that are in there. Um, the cliffs that are over by Whitney were created by the forams, and then the white cliffs of Dover. That's all just sediment that was created by forams. Um, Radiolarians, so these are amoebas, but in a glass shell. Um, their glassy shell, their pseudopodia will stick out from that. So here's those needle-like rhizaria thing that give the phylum their name going on right there. Um, last little group, Circozoa. These, this one right here is powdery scab from potatoes. It's a different species entirely from the Irish potato famine one, the Phytophthora. Um, but this one can also end up reducing the yields. Uh, Plasmodiophora brazicaceae, that one causes cabbage club root. So these really aren't hurting people, except they're hurting the things that people eat. So it can cause starvation if there's not a good food supply network in a specific area. Um, the archaeplastids are what you have next. This is named for the plastids, which are colored organelles that are present in cell. There's pigments that are stored in there usually, or food that can have a pigment that is stored in a plastid. Chloroplast is the best known example of a plastid that I know you guys will have heard of before. Um, archaeplastids are usually going to have both chlorophyll A and B. Some will only have chlorophyll A and then some accessory pigments. Um, the subgroup red algae, they're called that because they are algae that are red. Um, gelidium is the source, one of the sources for auger. Gracilaria is another, and auger is, of course, what we use to solidify media in lab. Chlorophytes. This is our green algae. Volvox is one that we have you guys look at in labs. Sometimes we even have a live sample so you can see them swimming around under the microscope slide. Alva is known as sea lettuce. Um, it looks kind of like butter lettuce that's in the ocean, essentially, and so that's why it's called sea lettuce. Okay, the amoebozoans. This is where you're going to have, like, amoebas, amoebas. Um, the, the ent amoebas, if you will. This is also the group that includes slime molds, which here in Texas, we don't get a lot of slime molds that you see. Um, if you go to other places, you will find them more often. But if you've ever had a leaf pile raked up in your yard, and then one day just green or yellow or orange snot takes over your leaf pile, that's a slime mold. They will travel around looking for things to decompose, and they are important decomposers. Okay, the ent amoebas. So every now and then in Texas, you hear about the brain-eating amoeba. That's Nigleria fowleri. Um, the little girl here in this picture, her name is Lily Avant. Um, this is from 2019. She was 10 years old at the time. She had been swimming in a river. They did not tell us what river she was swimming in, but she contracted the brain-eating amoeba, and then she died a couple of weeks after that. Now, a lot of people swim in rivers around here, and Nigleria is very common. Very few people die from it. Kind of what you have to do is train kids to make sure they don't inhale water through their nose because it's more likely that they can pick things up into the brain when they do that. And so it's more about teaching your kids how to swim without inhaling water that they shouldn't be. Um, Entamoeba histolytica is what causes amoebic dysentery. And if you're unfamiliar with dysentery, I went ahead and defined that for you on the slide. Just go play Oregon Trail because you're always going to die of dysentery in that game. Um, Acanthamoeba. Uh, keratitis is inflammation of the cornea. Remember, that's the clear window to the eye. And if you inflame that, it can make it opaque so you can't see anymore. Okay, opisthoconta. This is the group that animals are actually in, but so are fungi. So we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about animals aside from some worm species. We are going to spend some time talking about fungi, though, later on. Um, the groups that are under there, they used to be phyla. Some books still consider them phyla. Your book kind of just calls them groups. But um, zygomycetes, that's where like rhizopus is. This is common black bread mold, which is what you're seeing in that picture. Ascomycetes actually have a lot of different fungi, some of which are wonderful, edible, and in fact delicacies that if you find one can make you like tens of thousands of dollars. Some of them, though, are pathogens. The ascomycetes have more pathogens than any of the other groups of fungi. Basidiomycetes is what you think of when you think of a fungus, because usually when you say fungus, the first thing that pops into a person's mind is a mushroom, and that's a basidium, um, a basidiocarp specifically, and so basidiomycetes all make mushrooms. 
The microsporidia are actually obligate intracellular parasites, so you've got to have a microscope to see them. They're always going to be really small and living inside of cells. Mm -hmm. um, the animal group, this is where our worms are going to be. There's lots of other worms we're not going to talk about. We're really just going to spend some time talking about some of the um, pathogenic worms, as it were. So nematodes, that's phylum nematoda. They are round worms that are not segmented. Um, they don't have a true body cavity. They have what's known as a pseudocelome. Um, they can be microscopic, like a pinworm. You're going to need a microscope to be able to see it. Or they can be quite long. Um, hookworms and ascaris, those can be over a foot long, so you would not need a microscope to be able to see those. Um, trematodes, those are flukes. Flukes are flatworms, so imagine that you took a worm and you pressed it between the pages of a book. That's what a flatworm is. There's two classes we're going to talk about, the trematodes and the cestodes. The trematodes being the flukes. Flukes are usually um, gastrointestinal parasites. They very often attack the liver specifically. Um, schistosoma is the life cycle that I'm showing you here in this picture, if I remember correctly. Actually, now I'm thinking that's a different one. I'm trying to see what, yeah, no, that's just a soma. All right, so yeah, that's just a soma's life cycle there in that picture. And then cestodes, uh, class cestoda. These are tapeworms, and humans can get tapeworms. You get it from eating undercooked meats. Usually think fish like sushi should be inspected very well to make sure it doesn't have worms in it. Pork, if it's not inspected because you're eating like feral hogs, you got to make sure you cook it really well because if you get a tapeworm, not only can it be a GI parasite, but can, it can actually leave the gastrointestinal tract and travel around to the body and go specifically to the brain and cause major problems in the brain. So tapeworms aren't just all, yay, I'll lose weight and lower my allergies. They'll get into your brain and kill you. Don't play around with tapeworms. All right. From there, we are going to switch gears and start talking about some of our uh, fungal or protist well, fungus-like protists, if you will. So uridinomycetes, these are going to form rusts. Rusts are called that because they are little fungus-like things that grow on a leaf and make the leaf look rusty. Like this right here is what's going on. So this is a rust that is damaging this plant. Okay. Eustilagomycetes causes smuts instead of rusts. So smuts, this is corn smut which quite frankly, if I were to see an ear of corn that looked like that, I would chuck it as far away from me as I possibly could. But some people consider that to be a delicacy and they will pay a lot more money for an ear of corn that has a smut on it. I have no idea what it tastes like because like I said, not my thing. Okay, glomeromycota. This is where our, our buscular fungi are. So the mycorrhiza that forms in association with plant roots are in this group. So this is beneficial fungus instead of harmful fungus. Um, chytridiomycetes. This is where the chytrids are. Now, chytrids are unique because they have flagellated sperm, which means they need water in order to reproduce. Um, what I am going to focus on when it comes to the chytrids are they are causing massive amphibian die-offs around the world. And I mean like every continent except Antarctica is having a chytrid problem at this point. The chytrid fungus will get into the skin on an amphibian, which while amphibians do have lungs, they aren't very well developed, and so they actually do a lot of gas exchange through their skin. When the chytrid gets under their skin, it prevents them from doing gas exchange, and then that ends up killing the frogs off. Um, chytrids are being spread by things like deforestation, and we're taking things into places where we used to not be able to travel, and so chytrids are, are really causing some mass extinction level events for the amphibians. I should have warned you, I guess. Gross picture. Um, zygomycota. This is, again, where you got some normally stuff like black bread mold that is not really a huge problem for people, except it does cause food spoilage and waste money, essentially. But mucor is also in this group. Um, if you've never heard of necrotizing fasciitis, uh, pardon me, fasciitis, that is where... It's what normal people would call flesh-eating disease, and it's not just a bacterial infection. So here is a fungal flesh-eating disease, if you will. Um, if I remember right, this woman did not survive this infection either. So it, you can see it destroyed her lip, most of her nose, um, her eye is gone in this case. So that is what your book means when it says necrotizing infection is that picture right there. Okay. Ascomycetes, again, has got a lot going on. There are some really expensive mushrooms called morals in this group. Um, they are really unique looking too. If you don't know what a moral looks like, Google it. It's M-O-R-E-L. They're really interesting looking. Um, this group can be unicellular or it could be multicellular. 
they can reproduce sexually or asexually as most of our fungi can for that matter. The only ones that I wanted to mention for you guys, well, the ones in the books table, if you will, Aspergillus flavus is usually a food contaminant. Um, it is usually not found on people food so much as it is animal foods. And so you will hear of dog foods being recalled because of Aspergillus um, poisoning. And so that's what's going on there. So aflatoxin is one that pops up. Um, it's our, what, second toxin I think that we're talking about, because I think we've hit shigatoxin in a previous chapter, but aflatoxin specifically damages the liver. It's also a carcinogen, so if you survive it because it didn't kill your liver, it's probably going to give you cancer later on, so you don't really want to play around with aspergillus. Make sure you're always paying attention to recalls on your pet foods and things. Um, penicillium is the genus that produces penicillin, the antibiotic. Um, all of the next ones that you have, trichophyton, microsporum, epidermophyton, those all are dermatophytes, which means they cause skin infections. Um, like ringworm is an example of something that does that. Histoplasma capsulatum is what causes histoplasmosis. You don't see that all that often, but if you are a caver or hang around in places where bats tend to go, you can get histoplasmosis, which is a respiratory infection. Um, Coccidioides imidis causes valley fever. So valley fever is a desert thing. So if you ever travel like Arizona, New Mexico, the California desert, you can get coccidiomycosis. And so that's something you want to be on the lookout for if a person has traveled. Canada albicans causes yeast infections. That can be vaginal yeast infections. Sometimes diaper rash is actually a yeast infection. You can get yeast infections in your mouth. That's called thrush. You can also get yeast infections in other areas of the skin, and that's just a skin infection again. Um, Canada is part of the normal flora. That makes it sound like I'm saying Canada, but I'm saying Canada. Not Canada, the country. Candida, the yeast. Um, it's normally on you, but normally your bacteria keep the number of candida in check so that it doesn't overgrow. If you take antibiotics, you kill off a lot of the bacteria that live on you, and now candida is not being kept in check by the bacteria, and so it starts to overgrow, and that's when you get that yeast infection. So that's why yeast infections are actually a very common side effect of antibiotic treatment. Uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, if you've ever bought yeast at the grocery store, that's what you've bought is Saccharomyces. So this is what helps you make bread or brew beer or whatever. Uh, Basidiomycota, this is again the fungus that actually produces a mushroom that you guys would recognize as a mushroom. Um, Agricus compestris is an edible little field mushroom. Um, Amanita phylloides is the death cap. It, it, it's a beautiful mushroom. This is actually a picture of Amanita here. If you were to eat it though, you would, and I think I said this on a later slide, you would die very slowly as it starts to shut down all your systems because what it does is it blocks transcription. Remember that protein synthesis requires transcription and translation. If you can't transcribe the DNA and the RNA, your ribosomes can't make proteins. And if you can't make proteins, you die. But you die slowly. And so don't mess with a mushroom if you don't know what it is. Uh, microsporidia. The only one that I'm giving you out of this group is the enterocystozoan. Um, it causes some GI symptoms, usually, again, diarrhea. It can also cause respiratory infections, but usually only in people who are immunocompromised somehow. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of an idea of how these things work. I'm going to link you guys to a video on how fungi reproduce because their reproductive system is so different from how animals reproduce and from how bacteria reproduce for that matter. So please make sure you watch that video as well.